it's a pleasure speaking with you today and uh, you have been an inspiration to many of my generation and the ones that followed and uh, could you tell us a little bit for the young readers of uh, Resonance about your early life at uh, Benares and what motivated you uh, to take up a career in science? Well, I, I can say that uh, I was brought up uh, in an academic environment because my father was a professor in mathematics at the Banaras Hindu University and my mother was a scholar of Sanskrit. So <clears throat> both these sides uh, were uh, what I would call motivators. You know, uh, so I wanted to be, as you know, uh, many times people, when they are young, they are motivated by their father or mother. So in my case, uh, that certainly was the case. And I remember in uh, third standard, okay. when we were asked by the class teacher yes. to tell what your father is doing. Okay. So, most of the children uh, in the school were from the university faculty. Yes. So, they, they would answer that they were in this subject or that kind. Yes. So, when, when my turn came, uh, I remember that my father was called a professor. Yes. So, I just said that he, he is a professor. Yes. So, uh, my uh, teacher asked him, Professor of what? So I was uh, stumped because I did not <laughs> know what was his subject. So the teacher told me uh, to correct me or uh, oh, you should know uh, what your father uh, teaches. Uh, he is a professor of mathematics. So I was a bit ashamed that I did not know the answer. But I was also happy that uh, I felt that my father was doing the same subject that I liked best. Yes. So it was, in a sense, uh, the other way around. Yes. So I, I was knowing that I liked mathematics, but I didn't know my father was <laughs> <laughs> maths. So your love for mathematics started very early on in yeah, life. Yes. And he, uh, see, my uh, house was a kind of uh, open house for people yes. coming for academic visits. Yes. So in those days, the university guest houses were not so well equipped. Yes. So when some professors came for either ex examination purpose or some other academic purpose, they would stay with somebody they knew in on the campus. Yeah. So my f father had a uh, lot of such visitors yes. and I felt uh, very much happy uh, talking to them, yes. although they were uh, also very senior people, but they liked to talk to some boys or girls around. Yes. Which, so they were... Uh, uh, so they sometimes set me a puzzle to solve or this kind yes. of thing. So this sort of uh, environment yes. was one in which I always thrived and I felt it, this is the right kind of place. Yes. So it was intellectually very stimulating. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned, I remember you mentioning that uh, two of your uncles also came and stayed with you and oh, yes. miss you over there. And, that, that's uh, I, I should mention that my mama, yes. maternal uncle, yes. uh, he, we called him Moru Mama because his name was Moreshwar. Okay. So he was uh, uh, going to spend two years in our house yes. uh, because he was up, uh, sort of doing the MSc mathematics mm. course. Mm. So in BHU, he had come with a very good marks from uh, Bombay University, in, but he was uh, uh, fond of mathematics in various ways. Okay. So he, when he came to our house and he saw that there were a couple of blackboards on the wall, okay. 
So he asked uh, me, uh, what, what are these for? So I said, oh, we use them for uh, anything like drawing or m m making maps or for geography. Uh, all kinds of things, whatever we want. My father has said, you use these boards. Yes. So that's what we are doing. So he said, oh, can I use it occasionally? So he said, uh, so I said, yes, surely you are uh, m most welcome. So at that time, uh, uh, there was one small board and one large board. So the small one uh, uh, was taken over by him. And he wrote a problem on this. And it entitled it as challenge problem for JVN, <laughs> that is me. <laughs> so uh, when I saw that, uh, I asked him, uh, what, uh, what is this? I, he said, you read this uh, problem and uh, see if you can solve it. Uh, if you solve it, you win. If you don't solve it and ca can't solve it and I have to help you to solve it, then I have won. <laughs> yes. so that's how he put it like. Okay. So I took I took it as a challenge, as it was said on the board, challenge problem for okay. JVN. So uh, after a lot of effort, I managed to get it, so I could solve it. Okay. So my uncle was uh, quite happy, he said, I'm glad that you did not give up to solve it. Uh, and I thought that was the end of the matter, but next day there was another. <laughs> <laughs> and he kept on occasionally uh, giving me some such dose, okay. dose of <laughs> I wouldn't say medicine because it was uh, very p pleasing to actually have such problems. Sure, sure. And you managed to solve all of them. <laughs> <laughs> By, you know, I would say I, I may have solved 80% okay. or so, and 20% uh, okay. he okay. may have uh, given me some hint or this. Okay. Uh, but like, it was a fun, fun doing this sure, kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. That was the period when uh, Banaras Hindu University was also probably the, in its golden era. And uh, there was, during that period, 40 to 48, I think, was when uh, Sarvapali Radhakrishnan was the Vice Chancellor. Do you have any recollections of uh, that period of the university as such? Well, uh, when I was in school, hmm. the uh, vice chancellor was, of course, uh, uh, Radha Krishnan, hmm. and uh, he was a very a sort of awesome personality. Yes. That, uh, he would give Gita lectures, yes. lectures on Bhagavad Gita. Yes. which were very scholastic yes and uh, uh, he was friendly with my father yes so th they used to have a lot of discussion yes uh, he, i remember once that uh, uh, radha krishnan was walking along the streets okay. just for a stroll so at one place he found a lot of people listening to somebody so he went and stood outside to see what so this was a uh, Sikh, uh, Sikh religion mm -hmm. uh, get together okay. for I think it may have been Guru Nanak's birthday and my father had been invited to speak mm -hmm. and he was very well informed, well read on different religions. Mm -hmm. So he gave a very good talk. Uh, on Sikhism, mm -hmm. and at that time Radha Krishnan was standing outside listening. Mm -hmm. So he was very uh, impressed mm -hmm. that somebody who is not himself a Sikh is, yes. is knowing so much. Uh -huh. And my father, of course, was not professor of religion, but professor of uh, mathematics. mathematics. Yes. But he, his readings were such that uh, he would be able to give good talks on various occasions. Okay. Anyway, so Mahaj, uh, 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 Radha Krishnan 
was the first person that I saw it from a distance as a vice chancellor. Okay. Afterwards, uh, they were different vice chancellors. Mm -hmm. And soon after that, I left BHU because yes. I went abroad. Yes. Yes. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, going abroad, that you had mentioned that your choice of Cambridge was almost automatic after your early studies at uh, Benares. Uh, and could you tell us a little bit about your motivations for going to Cambridge and what was the background? Well, uh, the thing was, uh, first of all, my father was uh, a Cambridge graduate. Yes. And he was, uh, he had performed very well in uh, Cambridge. Yeah. And he's, uh, he was student of Eddington and uh, Larmore, uh, the, who were the senior professors there. And uh, so I wanted to go into mathematics. Yes. So uh, I felt that Cambridge provides the most competitive uh, examination system mm -hmm. for uh, going for into mathematics. Mm -hmm. So uh, I applied for, for that. My father, of course, wrote a covering note, and uh, uh, finally I got into the in. Uh, Fitzwilliam College was one of my, uh, this was the college my father was mm. in. So they usually like to have the son going to the <laughs> same college. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I in, uh, got into Cambridge because of this motivation to go for maths. You went for mathematics, but mm -hmm. then you also got motivated to work on astrophysics. Mm -hmm. And what were the most exciting pieces of work? Well, what, you... what happens in Cambridge system is that there are th the three, three parts of the mathematical examination, the tripos, okay. of which the uh, uh, first two parts give you a very wide base of mathematics both pure and applied. You you don't specialize in the, for the first two parts. Yes. The, but for the third part, you choose those subjects which you might consider uh, you, useful to you for future research career. Mm -hmm. So astrophysics, astronomy were the areas I felt that I, I would like to go in because Fred Hoyle and others who were lecturing, mm -hmm. they were the interesting lecturers. Mm -hmm. And other, uh, many times how they present the subject, you form your own impression of mm -hmm. what you like about it. Mm -hmm. So I uh, also went to public library and there were popular books by Fred Hoyle. Mm -hmm which frontiers of astronomy and nature of the universe. Mm -hmm. So these I uh, read and mm -hmm. I found them very, extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. So I said that I will go for uh, this specialized, special group of subjects mm -hmm. in my third part of the tripod, the last one. Okay. So after that, uh, in the third part, I uh, specialized in um, uh, this astronomy yes. and they had a what you call um, a, a special medal called Tyson medal yes. which was given to the person who did best in the astronomy okay. part of the tripos. Okay. There was a similar uh, prize called Mayu prize for those who di did theoretical physics yes. in uh, so uh, I had, uh, since I had opted for astronomy related. Yes. Anyway, I ended up getting that uh, award, yes. okay. the Tyson Medal, yes. which my father had also okay. got before. Okay. And as it happened, from his time to my time, no Indian had got it. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. So, okay. so it was some something of a novelty. Sure, sure. But, uh, uh, anyway, now that was the beginning 
uh, to go for astronomy. Okay. Uh, about uh, your work at Cambridge, uh, which perhaps excited you the most? Uh, okay, when I started my work, I was under Fred Hoyle. Uh, he asked me to, he gave me a list of around five problems. He said, and they ranged from various uh, parts of astronomy because Hoyle had a very wide Interest. kind of uh, influence on the subject. Yes. So I noticed that he, he did not mention steady state theory. Okay. So I asked him, uh, why, can't I work on a problem in steady state theory? So he said there exists a lot of possible problems if you want to, but he personally did not want a fresh research student to get into something which is controversial. Mm -hmm. So he said it, that for that reason I have not mentioned it. Mm -hmm. So I did not insist at that time when we looked at he gave me uh, this range of four or five problems, uh -huh. of which I selected one. It was about spinning universes. Yes. And problem was by Heckman and Schuking who were uh, claiming that such universes will uh, oscillate yes. without singularity. Yes. So I, uh, he, Fred wanted this to be checked because they had not solved the equations. Uh -huh. So he had asked uh, me to look at those equations which they have given, how they have derived it, and if it is correct, or is, does it oscillate yes. to work out on that. Yes. And then the next part was if it did oscillate, yes. to see how th nucleosynthesis worked in the universe, yes. uh, with, because when it is contracting, uh, you would expect uh, that the, the things to break up, whereas expanding, yes. you have the fusion, nuclear yes. fusion. So it was a basically an interesting problem. Yes. And while uh, he was abroad for two weeks, two, three months, yes. uh, he used to go to Caltech uh, for three months in the year. Or yes. So when he came back, I had the solution to the problem, yes. saying that this, their claim that it was uh, free from singularity is not correct. It has a singularity and yes. uh, it cannot oscillate. Yes. So the whole uh, subsequent part was not yes. applicable. Yes. So he said, okay, I will mean, find another problem. <laughs> <laughs> So while this was going on, uh -huh. there were the uh, problem uh, Hoyle had with Ryle yes. about counting of radio sources. Yes. And Ryle's claim was that his, his 4C catalog yes. uh, was showing uh, that the universe is, uh, uh, the, in the past was had more radio sources per unit volume than they have today. Yes. So it, it was uh, indicative of not steady state, yes. but uh, evolutionary. Yes. yes. That was uh, the, uh, his challenge to Fred that the, his uh, radio data disproved steady state theory. Yes. So Hoyle wanted to, uh, Hoyle was expected to reply after uh, the, the, he uh, Ryle had spoken or presented his paper mm. at the Ro Royal Astronomical Society. Yes. So uh, Hoyle said that we will work out a model which uh, matches R Ryle's data, but is not inconsistent with steady state. Okay. So it, uh, it looked like a tall order, but we managed to get a model okay. like that and uh, we, uh, we, I made a few slides of various things for projection. So uh, he said, uh, he gave me a shock at that point 
that uh, he said that he won't have time to go and speak at the RAS because uh, he had already committed to give a talk somewhere else in London. So he said, you, you talk in my place. <laughs> so I was very scared that uh, I had no experience of uh, public speaking, especially in Eng England and on a topic of it, where my ad adversary was going to be a very re respected or what you would call experienced yes. uh, person. So uh, I will make a mess of it. So uh, Fred said, and uh, no, if you are, if you believe what you have done is correct, then the, you have only got to present it and tell them, this is our mathematical solution. Yes. They can't say anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that and okay. I gave a talk. Yes. Uh, ten, 10 minutes were allotted in which to present yes. and people generally appreciated what I had mm -hmm. said and it gave, gave me good uh, kind of confidence yes. that I can present work mm -hmm. and uh, in, in front of very experienced astronomers, astrophysicists and the second thing was that I was uh, uh, willy nilly brought into work on steady state theory, <laughs> <laughs> which Hoyle was trying to avoid. Okay. And it was certainly controversial, sure, but, sure. but it came very naturally, so I continued on that. Okay. So that period also saw Hoyle establishing the mm. Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge, yes. which is a world renowned institution today. And uh, so what aspects of institution building do you think Hoyle sort of paid uh, particular attention to while laying the foundations of the institution? See, uh, Hoyle was uh, the Plumian professor in Cambridge. The, the, uh, the, this is a Plumian professor of astronomy. Hmm. So he, he's, he was um, that way quite influential. Hmm. But at the same time, uh, he found that to carry out any work uh, in collaboration with people outside, mm. it was very difficult mm. because the university's rules of uh, various uh, th things what that you w want need for uh, doing your work, the research uh, support. Mm. That was being done in a very uh, old-fashioned way. Mm. And Fred was seeing how Americans handle this. Mm. And he wanted that culture to come into Cambridge. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the old days, you had people like Eddington or uh, the, the, uh, what's his name? Uh, Lar Larmor is the yes. name, and that, yes. who were individually very good, mm -hmm. but they had no support at all of any mm -hmm. kind that uh, American professors mm -hmm. would have. Mm -hmm. So he wanted a, a, an institution which was full, free from a lot of those uh, old-fashioned rules, mm -hmm. and so he made a I made an attempt to have it done uh, in Cambridge mm -hmm. and with the help of the government support. There, there are Labour and uh, the Conservative governments. Yes, yes. At that time, there was Conservative government, okay. and they, as, uh, he, he managed to consult, uh, sort of convince the education minister mm -hmm. that it would be good to have an institute like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, the next uh, month or so after that he was convinced, the, there was an election and <laughs> the, uh, the other party came up, okay. the Labour Party. Okay. So he had to again work. And the Labour Party's view was uh, surely they would su 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 support mm -hmm. astronomy. Mm -hmm. 
uh, as Fred wanted, mm. but uh, they want to do it in other universities, not mm. in Cambridge okay. <laughs> or Oxford, because the feeling was growing that these two universities uh, get all the cream uh, of it. Uh, other universities can't mm -hmm. get any support. So, yes. Labour government wanted to uh, support th them. So, yeah. they said, we will support as institute yeah. in uh, uh, not not in Cambridge, but in uh, uh, this uh, near near it was near the Harshmansu Castle. Okay. Uh, the the, the university, new university had come up yes. in near Brighton, the yes. University of Sussex, yes. as it was called. Yes. So he said in so they said in Sussex University they will give uh, astronomy center all the money. Yes. And they wanted Hoyle to be director of that. Yes. So so Hoyle felt that the real uh, sort of atmosphere for high class work uh -huh. is in Cambridge and then a new place like Sussex it won't be for a very long time. Yes. So, <coughs> so he did not go for it. Mm -hmm. So somebody else became the director of Sussex Centre. And Hoyle, in the meantime, went to private uh, agencies, yes. private uh, foundations. Yes. And Nafield and Wolfson Foundation mm -hmm. gave, gave him money for building as well as first five years running. Okay. After that, it was his business to how to continue it. So Hoyle said, okay, if the place is, if the institute so constructed does well, then there won't be any problem for continuing it. Yes. If it doesn't do well, then if it folds up, it doesn't matter. Yes. So, so he was kind of uh, sink or swim kind of uh, attitude and he put the institute into operation uh, and it worked very well for the first five years. Yes. So after that they said that uh, uh, we will continue to support it. The yes. government agreed to support uh, and they can combine the uh, observ observatory. Yes with the institute. Yes. So it used to be Institute of Theoretical Astronomy yes. that changed to Institute of Astronomy yes. because theoretical was dropped. Yes. So uh, Hoyle was not completely happy. He felt that uh, the uh, university uh, ast uh, astronomy facility till then was very poor. Yes not of the order like Mount Wilson or Mount Palomar in, yes. the, in the US. Yes. So he felt that he will be carrying a lot of uh, load which is not productive. At the same time, he, the prof new professor was to be appointed uh, for observational astronomy because the Redman who was the professor, he had retired. Yes. So uh, Hoyle wanted uh, Wall Sargent yes. to be the pro uh, professor. And uh, uh, there were a lot of maneuverings behind the scene and uh, they finally appointed Lyndon Bell. Yes. And Hoyle was of, of the opinion that although Lyndon Bell was very bright, uh, astro astronomer, he was more a theoretician than a, an observer. Yes. So he felt that this was the wrong choice. Okay. <laughs> so he, he resigned in protest. Okay. And uh, the, the, that meant he was out of the usual circuit. Uh -huh. but, but he did not care. He liked to work by himself. Mm -hmm. And he bought a house in uh, Lake District, yes. where he liked to yes. go for hiking. Yes. And he would work there by himself. 
that's one of the very beautiful parts of england like yeah. lake district yeah <laughs> yeah it, it, in eventually i i think it was a wrong decision to have resigned he should have continued to work there in cambridge yes and uh, his presence would have inspired a lot of yes. uh, school uh, colleges college students yes. to come and the institute of astronomy over the years has contributed immensely on both the theoretical yes. and the observational fronts right? yeah i mean he he, he had uh, this unique character could you tell us a little bit of your working relationship with uh, the stalwarts of the time like hoyle and burbage mm-hmm. kind of work that you really enjoyed doing at uh, both the professional and yeah uh, we uh, we started working together yes <clears throat> of course i had worked with hoyle and burbage had worked with hoyle mm. but the three of us working together mm. this had not really happened except uh, except towards na- in the early 90s mm. now at that time uh, we used to meet in the in cambridge mm. so i went from uh, uh, pune mm. and uh, uh, barvish came from san, san diego yes and uh, fred came from uh, bournemouth where he was he had shifted yes so all three we used to meet in uh, the uh, what, what they call the uh, greenwich observatory has yes. shifted yes to uh, cambridge yes so F- fred was uh, uh, margaret burbage yes who, who was the uh, uh, leading observational astronomer in england mm-hmm. she had been uh, the, the press, uh, what they call the uh, director of greenwich observatory so after this thing happened she was she used to, to be given facilities to work mm-hmm. whenever she came to cambridge yes so she had got this huge room in yes. which all four of us could sit okay because barbage and uh, wow. uh, husband and yes. wife and fred and i the four of us we worked there and uh, we could do uh, we had a way, uh, fred uh, no uh, jeff d- discovered a new way of preparing manuscript so we were working on a paper so each evening he would uh, hand write what was done and he would fax it to san diego so okay. so it would be morning in san diego yes. because of time Definitely. difference so uh, his secretary would be coming for work uh, and she would get this fax so she would type it uh, and she would fax it back in on the, in the uh, afternoon yes in san diego yes. and that fax would come to cambridge Uh, next morning yes so we had the whole thing typed okay uh, and ready okay uh, at the start of the new work so again the same thing would be repeated at the end of the day okay. so this time difference was put to a good use yes because in cambridge itself if he he had given it to some secretary to type she she would have been be- behind because in the evening she couldn't she work and gone home <laughs> yes by doing it across yes. was a new sure. a clever use of the time difference so what was the particular problem you were working on oh the, at that that time? time we came up with our modification of steady state theory yeah. which we called quasi steady state cosmology yes that was uh, explaining everything we could also explain microwave background okay we could explain dark matter and everything okay so this uh, work was published in separate papers as well as t- together as a book okay. so could you elaborate a little bit on how the quasi steady state might explain the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation yeah uh, see in the case of uh, 
steady old steady state theory there was no uh, process known we should produce a microwave background uh, yes. at uh, at such a uh, close uh, what what you call uh, uh, that it it explained the black body oh, yes. radiation yes. was very precise very, very precise so how yeah. to get that mm. thing so what we had was the following mm. that uh, this uh, re- steady state quasi steady state model had expansion contraction expansion contraction mm-hmm. and in each of these mm. uh, cycles mm. you will have st- st- stars burning out mm. they will shine and then they will burn out mm. then next cycle again new stars were will be born and mm. same thing happen so you have uh, in a sense uh, radiation from stars mm-hmm. uh, knocking knocking ar- around for a long time mm-hmm. so it then becomes uh, we we showed how it gets thermalized okay and it gave a temperature which is about 2.7 k okay now in big bang uh, cosmology although you explain microwave background you don't get the temperature as 2.7 k you have to take it as a given board given data there is no process which tells you why the temperature should be 2.7 whereas in our model it it could be shown quantitatively that all the relic starlight could be thermalized to be can give you microwave Uh, and you background also, okay. and you also explored the formation of structures in this uh, quasi steady state scenario yeah yeah so the quasi steady state comes like this uh, we can uh, go further in this that when these stars are burnt out what is left is a uh, and is what we what is seen as dark matter mm-hmm. because it's no longer shining this on a team of cosmology i mean today we have uh, entered the regime of what is called precision cosmology where uh, the parameters in the current cosmological model have been determined to greater accuracy uh, than probably ever before so what in your view are uh, some of the outstanding issues that we still need to address in our understanding of the universe to today today yeah well if you <coughs> take the classical big bang theory yes the problem still remains what what was this event singularity which is identified as big bang yes and how what kind of physics operated hmm. if you think that at such a small level Uh, you should have quantum gravity mm. then we must have a formal theory of quantum gravity mm. which we don't mm. so the whole thing is uh, go- uh, going around with a number of uh, un uh, proven or un- understood mm. uh, kind of statements mm-hmm. which therefore makes me feel very uncomfortable mm-hmm. with the whole scenario if you had something like a singularity free oscillation mm-hmm. then one can go on for, for infinity mm-hmm. and there won't be many problems this this is what i feel also i <coughs> have a suspicion that there must be uh, stars around which are older than the 14 giga year that one associates with the whole universe mm. uh, but this uh, uh, these stars which which are uh, old so old will appear in different parts of the hr diagram and one needs to do more 
study of such stars in our galaxy. Yeah. I mean, so far we have not found any. Which so far seen. they have not been found, but they have not been looked for also. Okay. <laughs> because you. what happens is, okay. people say that according to cosmology, there can't be anything older than huh. 14 giga years. Yes. So if I said, uh, uh, look for a star of that age, People are not very keen to look. The, in broader canvas of cosmology is one aspect of it, hmm. but in astrophysics, besides cosmology, uh, what do you think are the key astrophysical issues and problems that we need to understand today? See, see, see if you look at cosmology today, hmm. uh, it stands apart from the rest of astronomy. Yes. If you take even galactic structure, uh, that is the largest thing, uh, kind of system which you study. Uh, you find you are using different kind of arguments. Mm. Then when you do only uh, uh, cos the cosmological mm. studies, because cosmology is, is um, made of full of uh, uh, unproven assumptions mm. like what you call non-baryonic dark matter mm. or dark energy. Mm. They, they are not known in f normal physics, mm. but you are putting them in mm. uh, as a kind of assumption which you think, which, which actually has not been proved. Yes. So I feel it is a uh, kind of different sort of discipline to the rest of astronomy, okay. cosmology today. Okay. I mean, they have been introduced to explain the ob observations, but the nature of dark matter and dark energy is not understood. Yes. The nature of dark matter is not understood. And uh, uh, the question is, when you understand it, you must also know how it got there. Yes. <laughs> Origin of. Yes. And what do you think of dark energy? Hmm? <laughs> what do I think the bulk? Of? As I said in our theory, yes. it is the burnt out stars, okay. which are the dark matter. Yes. And what about dark energy? Uh, what about? Dark energy. Huh, dark energy. That is because of the uh, supernova observation that you get um, uh, accelerating universe. Yes. Now, in uh, our cosmology, one can explain the supernova with inter without having to, to bring in accelerating universe. And uh, we have actually given the and a detailed uh, um, analysis of how it can be done. Okay. Uh, so uh, we feel that uh, it, there is no need to have strange kind of matter mm -hmm. or strange kind of energy mm -hmm. to understand cosmology okay. today. Okay. Now, uh, getting on to uh, uh, coming to TIFR in uh, 72, and you were there in uh, the Tata Institute from 72 to 89. And uh, so could you tell us a little bit about your uh, motivation for coming back to India, to TIFR, and also the challenges and the successes you faced in uh, setting up a very active group in theoretical astrophysics mm -hmm. at uh, Bombay? Well, I had long been feeling that I should get back to India mm -hmm. Uh, to uh, help in the growth of astronomy there. Mm. Uh, now that uh, the uh, communications are so easy, uh, I felt that I was, would not be isolated uh, if I went to Tata Institute or a place like that, which had good contact with the outside mm. world. So I felt uh, that I should give it a chance, mm -hmm. and if it works, it's fine. Mm -hmm. 
So I came on that basis and in the first few uh, years I could settle down. Mm -hmm. And again, my brief was to grow astrophysics group in the TIFR. Mm -hmm. And I managed to get some good students and mm -hmm. uh, good visitors who mm -hmm. set, settled down. So I felt that on the whole, uh, this effort was worth it. Yes. And Any it, specific challenges you think you faced? Well, ch challenges. Yes. When N NRIs come back, yes. there, there are all kinds of problems. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, these are uh, also faced, for example, uh, the gas cylinder which, which you need for cooking. Uh, when I went uh, to uh, the, the office, they said that there is a long waiting list. Uh -huh. all, and all this kind of thing, my telephone, TIFR said we will give you a free telephone. But the line is not available. Uh, so if you can get a line from Bombay Telephone, we will provide the facility. So the, the, the Bombay Telephone said you can't have anything until five years. Five years waiting list yes. for telephone. Yes. So at that stage, I wrote a letter to Yashwant Rao Chavan, who was especially interested in getting me come to Bombay. Or, yes. And I mentioned these were the problems. So he said he will tell uh, concerned authorities. He was himself minister. Yes. And uh, after a couple of days, I got a SOS from uh, uh, Bombay Telephone saying, uh, we have a sanctioned line for you. <laughs> I uh, wanted to get my daughter to the first standard. And the principal said that you are in the last priority because uh, this is to be given to uh, services children. And if not, then transferable central government jobs. And uh, you, you are kind of a, any other leftover. <laughs> so we, uh, he said he will do his best to get me mm -hmm. uh, an admission for my daughter. Mm -hmm. But he could not just now promise until the whole thing was settled. Mm -hmm. And then he also said why, uh, you sh I should write to the commissioner of education mm -hmm. who was in charge of the central schools in, in Bombay area. Uh, he sat in, uh, his office was in IIT Bo Bombay. Mm -hmm. So I went, uh, no, I didn't, I say, wrote a letter to him requesting his approval. So uh, after I wrote about two, three days later, I got a phone call from him. And he said that uh, he was uh, attending my lecture in Bangalore mm -hmm. about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm when I was visiting India mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. abroad mm -hmm. and I was very impressed by the, that talk mm -hmm. he, he said to me. Mm -hmm. And he said, it gives me great pleasure to say yes to your request. <laughs> so that is how it happened. Uh -huh. So I to told my wife that, see, the, this is the advantage of lecturing in <laughs> astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Getting on to other aspects, uh, Jain, public outreach has been one aspect which you have laid a lot yes, of emphasis I, on. I, I have always felt that uh, to get, get your subject into a hmm. more popular vein, hmm. we have to get it closer to the common man. Yes. And that is wh what I have been trying to do. Yes. I mean, you have laid a strong foundation of Ayuka's uh, public outreach program as well. Mm -hmm. put a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, but nationally, I think there's a lot more that we need to do. Uh, what do you think or what would you suggest actually? See, we, uh, uh, when we are making the rules for Ayuka, mm. at that time I felt that I should put it, put this in as mm. one of the things they, that the center should do. Uh, 
Yes. And uh, certainly this worked. Uh, although I, we had to get money for the thing from other sources because mm. government uh, UGC grant doesn't cover mm. school education as, or general public uh, outreach mm. is not covered by UGC grants. Mm. So we had to get private help yes. and that came gradually. Mm. And as you saw uh, in P.L. Deshpande yes. and his yes. wife, yes. Sunita Deshpande, yes. they were very impressed by our uh, work mm. and they uh, gave money to for the construction of the building, mm. which we named after the star Pulaste. Mm -hmm. And Pulaste also mm. contains Pula, mm. which is Pula Initials Desh. of yeah. Pula Desh Pandey. Okay, yes. So that uh, has been a very successful venture. Mm. Yes. And we are getting grants from mm. various other uh, sources mm. to continue this work. Yes. That has been doing very well. Uh, but nationally, I think we are still sort of way behind in terms of uh, different institutions emulating such models or doing it on scales, although science is celebrated more than it used to be before. But uh, would you have any sort of comments or suggestions on how one might increase even further uh, the outreach See, my feeling is what we are doing is something that could be easily repeated. Yes. By other uh, institutes. In, uh, institutes or mm -hmm. Uh, laboratories mm -hmm. and I feel that it is necessary to do it mm -hmm. because otherwise we keep getting more and more into the uh, situation where instead of uh, trusting real science mm -hmm. we get into the pseudoscience Absolutely, yeah. range and think that that is yeah. the real thing yeah. which is of course very dangerous. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, on the topic of sort of, you know, pseudoscience, which uh, one keeps hearing about at all levels, including meetings of the Indian Science Congress. And one of the important aspects is obviously, you know, inculcating scientific temper amongst the general public. And you have also been a crusader against uh, superstition, particularly astrology. And uh, would you like to tell us something a little bit about the experiments which you did or your steps to show uh, that astrology is not uh, science. Yes. Uh, see, we had conducted an experiment just to see how uh, reading birth charts, you can make a certain prediction yes. and that a correct prediction can come out by looking through birth chart or not Yes. to test this hypothesis. And we um, managed to get uh, about 100 uh, birth charts of mentally retarded children okay. and 100 birth charts of very bright scholarly children. Yeah. We mixed them up and uh, took out groups of 40 mm -hmm. at random mm -hmm. and offered them to astrologers to tell whether they can tell from each of the 40 birth charts which they belong to. Yes. So they, some about 50 astrologers took part in it, of which finally some 30 or odd really completed the test. Mm -hmm. And we had said that in order to be statistically significant, uh, you must be right so many times. Yes. And we calculated this yes. thing. Yes. And then we found that uh, uh, they fell far short of what was the statistically required yes. uh, ratio. Yes. And uh, we said that uh, uh, instead of 28 out of 40 to be correct. That was the minimum required. Yes. 
the maximum they got was about tw- uh, 18 I to see. 20 out of okay. 40. Okay. So they um, did not succeed in predicting correctly. So the idea is to use similar technique for more mm-hmm. tests, which I hope will be possible in, in, in due course. Yeah. Yeah, but I think these results and tests uh, should actually permeate to the general public as well, so that uh, they get to know about it and can well, question. The, the public uh, is, is of two kinds, those who believe in astrology, those who don't. <laughs> and my feeling is that we are in a state st- stage where um, these are firm views. Yes. So, those who believe in astrology will continue to believe it, even if you give them very sound evidence against Uh it. But maybe we are making some uh, headway at the younger age. Yes. School children, I think, are probably better off today. Yes. When they're still sort of thinking and are yeah. curious about the world at large. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. And uh, in terms of uh, scientific temper as well as uh, rational thinking, I think we also need to get a lot more of our ideas and thoughts and scientific writings into regional languages. And uh, you have been writing in extensively in both Marathi as well as Hindi, in addition to English. And uh, Akashahi Jadale Nate is one of your Marathi sort of books, mm-hmm. which has mm-hmm. been very well received. And uh, uh, could you tell us uh, your views on how we might actually uh, promote regional writing at a much more uh, sort of wider level or wider uh, level than what is being done right mm-hmm. now? I feel that uh, one should have perhaps more awards available for okay. people who do this kind of writing okay. to uh, encourage them to do more. That is one possibility that I can think of. Okay. The other is uh, the, at school level, yes. uh, we introduce one, um, my suggestion is just one period in a week. You have a, a situation where people will ask any questions and they can be answered and uh, in general uh, anti-superstition yes ideas can be given you you can have you don't need to have a full story but mm-hmm. you can have discussions yes question answer like that yes uh, Jane, you also found uh, time to write science fiction and uh, I think one of your early attempts was uh, competing in the competition by the Marathi Vidyan Parishad where you wrote under a pen name of uh, Narayan Vinayak Jagtap and uh, could you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write science fiction and how that might also help in the larger scheme of uh, inculcating scientific temper Mm -hmm. amongst the citizens? Well, uh, I had seen my supervisor uh, and mentor, Fred Hoyle, writing some good science fiction like uh, Black Cloud and uh, uh, A for Andromeda and like that. And I felt that uh, I should also try the same thing, but in Marathi, because Marathi had very few uh, science fiction type of stories. Yes. So I uh, took part in a competition uh, for writing science fiction. Yes. It was conducted by Marathi Vidnyan Parishad. Yes. And the idea was to uh, people to to write about 2000 pa- uh, words. Yes. Uh, for each, each science fiction story. And they would judge and give a prize to the best story and so on. Yes. So I uh, dis- decided to take part in this. Yes. But I felt that uh, they would know my handwriting <laughs> if I sent. And uh, I didn't want them to be in any way uh, 
sort of affected by the fact that I was one of the candidates. Yes. So I asked my wife to write it. Okay. Write it in transcribing. <laughs> yeah, her handwriting was would not be known to them, yes. and uh, I used a different name. So I called it Narayan Vinayak Jagtap, yes. which is the initials are the reverse of my Jain Vishnu Narayan. Okay, yes. So uh, I sent this thing from an address which was not my usual address. And uh, after some time, I heard that I got the first prize. Yes. So uh, then I felt uh, confident that uh, I may, I'm able to write some stories. Yes. So I uh, then the revealed myself that yes. it, that story was written by me. Yes. And uh, after some time, I heard that Durga Bhagwat. Yes. Who, is, who was a distinguished lady uh, writer uh, and was ch chairman, chairperson of the Marathi Sahitya Sammelan. Yes. She dis referred to this story and said okay. that uh, it was encouraging to have new ideas uh, okay. like science fiction coming into Marathi. And she <laughs> welcomed that. So this was a big uh, boost for me yes. to write. So and what was the name of that story and what was it oh, about? For the one I got award for was Black Hole. Black Hole, okay. okay. Krishna Weaver is, okay. was the name of the okay. story. Okay. And that used some property of going close to the black hole and circling and then coming out again. Okay. So, but so long as you are outside the horizon, you are yes. able to come out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this was uh, okay. the basic story. Okay. So among the ones you've written, which is your favorite one? Then? Well, <clears throat> I wrote one on uh, um, which is called Ujvya Sondecha Ganpati, which yes. is Ganesha with the who sold is to the right. No, the Ganesha sold is usually to the left. Yes. All the murti. Yes. So this was about one um, uh, idol yes. of Ganesha, yes. which was which had this thing on the right hand side. Yes. So how was that uh, achieved? Yes. So there I got a thing that is, you got a machine that the scientist in which if you go in and come out yes. your parity changes, <laughs> changes. Okay. and this was uh, used for uh, this purpose and it starts by saying that there is a bowler who is uh, not very effective anymore and people were thinking of ditching him yes. but being the last test match he was allowed to play and he said that he would like to bowl from left hand. Yes. So they said this must be joking. If some, he was known to be a right hand bowler. So he said, no, I want to try this on, on this occasion. Yes. This is my last match anyway. So he play, bowls with the left hand and all the batsmen are completely confused. Yes. Because they expect him to be a right-hander thing, yes. and how he will learn to, how he won the match for the country. <laughs> okay. That was this start, and then this how this happened. Yes. Was well. okay. so. I, I like that so, so writing okay. like that. Okay. Okay. Now let's get on to Ayuka, uh, Jant. That this is a institution which you established. And it has grown very well, and uh, it is internationally one of the best centers for research in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your motivations for starting Ayuka, um, and also, you know, what led to it, and and also the institutional structures that you tried to put in place uh, to really establish a world class institute. Yeah. Well, the. Uh uh, being working in TIFR, hmm. I al always got the feeling that, that 
certainly i was having a good job at a good environment and so forth but i was uh, aware that a large number of university population is uh, unable to have access to good data or good for conditions and so on. so can something be done for the universities as a whole so i used to just worry about it not mm. i couldn't do anything by mm. myself mm. and then uh, it one day it so happened that yashpal mm. was the chairman of the ugc, UGC. Mm. he said that he would like to consider having an inter university center mm. uh, in astronomy and astrophysics mm. and the idea was uh, faci- creating centralized facilities mm. to be shared by university ca- mm. ca- people mm. and uh, this came to very close to what i had been thinking mm. so in the brainstorming and the thinking about it mm. that went on mm. uh, i was able to make some contribution mm. and ultimately the, it came to writing a report mm. on how to create such an institute and uh, yashpal said to me uh, after he saw the report is that the report is good but i would support it only if you take the responsibility to achieve it mm-hmm. so i was very uh, taken aback and yashpal said that uh, he knows that people in tifr mm-hmm. cuz he himself was before mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, they go outside tifr they come back mm. because they are not happy working elsewhere mm. so you must give me a commitment that you won't come back <laughs> yeah <laughs> see so i said uh, if you give me the freedom to work yes. on this institute then i will certainly give you that i mean i, I the way i should work Uh, i have certain ideas which i want to put in practice yes so if i am given that freedom yes. then i will be happy to work without any lean on sure the tifr job yes so he said that yes, i give you that commitment yes and so um, it worked out that i will uh, take up the responsibility of building that uh, inter university center yes and uh, i made all kinds of rules which were in general ac- accepted yes so in some cases they ma- made some modification yes uh, i remember asking one of these joint secretaries who was in charge of uh, ayuka from ugc side mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, i asked him uh, can i do this or can i do that like that mm. so he said uh, sir uh, don't uh, ask us whether you could do it or not you go ahead if you think it's good for the institute you go ahead and yes. do it yes and we will later on support you okay but he said if you ask us in the first place yes we may not know whether it is good or bad and yes so uh, we may not uh, give you the right answer that's a very enlightened so, view from a bureaucrat actually yeah yeah this was a very enlightened bureaucrat <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it worked well yes i got the kind of basic mm-hmm. structure uh, which i think they are still following yes when you said you sort of tried to put progressive rules and regulations in place uh, that was largely to you know give academic freedom encourage uh, academic work mm. encourage universities to interact over here you uh, know is there any specific I, aspect of the rules and regulations which you mentioned that I, you would like to sort of highlight you, you mean now of the of ayuka ayuka you see ayuka was created to be uh, an institution which uh, uh, from pune it advises and or gives useful advice to mm. people who are interested in astronomy astrophysics from university side yes. at the same time uh, our mandate is to encourage them to work yes 
using these facilities yes. so that they cannot should not complain that they are having no facilities uh, yes. the travel was paid for for coming yes and they could uh, use the facilities to which is the yes. computer or yes. uh, the library or uh, instrumentation center yes. all these facilities were available yes so um, the uh, uh, success of ayoka depends depended on how much they are used yes. these facilities yes and this is what i am satisfied with that there, there is a fair number of users yes we had a, an anticipated about 100 yes so that 100 has been crossed and yes. there, there are people yes. even more than say 120 or so yes. who are using ayuka facilities yes uh, to and their quality of work has improved with as we see from the publications yes. in, in uh, good journals and so on yes. so this this is what we had hoped for from ayuka yes and that has hap is happening yes and i suppose the location of ayuka was also influenced by the gmrt being built by govind over here yes uh, Yashpal was very keen on it that uh, that if the if such a big national facility like a, your um, uh, see Narayanagar being very close to yes. Pune, yes. Uh, we he preferred yes. to have the facility in Pune, yes. so that GMRT can be. Yes. Access. Yes. So, in fact, he was hoping that uh, universities could be employed, university pop population could be employed in actually construction of GMRT. That mm -hmm. is any mm -hmm. thinking or discussion. Mm -hmm. That I don't think happened. But after GMRT was built, mm -hmm. uh, there have been users yes. from the university sector. Yes. Yes. Which is a good thing and yes. we uh, certainly gain by having NCRA next to Ayuka yes. as an alternative place to work yes. or for go for lectures yes. and so on. And there also been a joint graduate school and collaboration between the Yeah, graduate school is shared. Yeah. So, so I think this is a good development. Yeah, this is a good development. And the inter-university center was also a relatively new concept when Ayuka was mm. set up, uh, and that has uh, worked well. And uh, yes, I think on the whole, that is uh, it has been a very positive experience. Yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Ayuka has actually grown quite a bit, and as you said, today the number of associates has crossed one hundred and sixty, uh, and. And Ayuka is also taking part in several uh, major observation projects, so it's sort of grown in both the observation as well as the theoretical aspects, LIGO India, TMT, the SALT, and part of the square kilometer array as well. Uh, is there any aspect that you think we should pay a bit more emphasis on as far as Ayuka is concerned in the next uh, sort of five to ten years? Well, well <laughs> this is one thing that. Uh can be uh, highly personalized what yes, I yes. say that <clears throat> I, I saw the Institute of Astronomy in the, uh, go, grow from very modest size yes. to what it has today yes. and uh, if you go there today you find it's uh, it's quite big yes and I don't somehow feel very comfortable in in that kind of size institute okay. and uh, now there is a talk in ayuka to to grow to have another campus and this kind of thing uh, i feel in many cases that small is beautiful okay. is, is a good <laughs> principle and growing it too much uh, is probably not a good thing. You can certainly have more 
institutions like Ayuka elsewhere in the country uh, and link them together rather than have one institution having so many uh, uh, sort of branches. Yes. This, like I think TIFR has done the same thing. TIFR has done similar. It, it goes on giving franchise, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they are all, uh, it would have been it, like it, I kept saying Professor Swaroop that he should go for an independent uh, GMRT or NCRA and not be a kind of part of uh, TIFR. So, so, so as, but he wanted to have it connected with TIFR yeah. to, to, so I said, you, your status is already so good yeah. that you don't need TIFR to back you up. <laughs> so this kind of argument used yeah. to go on. Yeah. And uh, like the Institute of Astronomy, both Ayuka and NCRA, we started from Golebanglo, a very small place yes. in Pune University <laughs> and have grown. Uh, but on the aspect of TIFR, obviously there will be debates both ways. Uh, but one of the interesting things which have happened is that uh, we are, you know, NCRA is getting a reasonable number of good students from the TIFR chain as well now and uh, from the TIFR channel, which has been a positive thing. Uh, but I'm sure there will be arguments both ways. Uh, we'll not take too much of the more time. I just wanted to you know, probably touch one or two things on a personal note that uh, I probably first met you in uh, the famous summer school of 76 when you traveled with us in the bus to Uti and uh, gave us puzzles to solve and not that I managed many but uh, this was probably a very similar philosophy to what you mentioned earlier about Morubama writing puzzles for you on the board but it was uh, fantastic to be able to interact with you as a very young student and uh, whereas that is not the kind of culture we see in many of our institutions of higher education which uh, are very hierarchical and uh, often the interaction between even senior faculty and junior faculty leaves a lot to be desired let alone the students so how do we how do you think we bring about a change in culture in our institutes of higher education how do you how do you think we'll actually uh, bring about a change in the culture of uh, education in our institutes of higher education where there is far more interaction between students and faculty it's more egalitarian more transparent and it's functioning i i think there should be more interaction hmm. at all levels at all levels yeah. yeah for example i had made a rule when i was director hmm. that you can come and knock on my door hmm. If I am free, I will certainly talk to you at that mm. time, whenever you come. Mm. If I am not free, mm. I will tell you when I can see you. Mm. So I don't want to be inaccessible or mm. person mm. Of, uh, uh, always available. That mm. was the thing. And the other thing was that in many cases in mm. government institutions, science mm. institute, mm. you find that you people don't like to contradict hmm. the superior hmm. but hmm. so they will always hmm. uh, side with him hmm. and uh, this I, I had discouraged i said if you scientifically hmm. you feel you are hmm. right hmm. then you don't need to hmm. be uh, afraid of your boss sure so i, I, I hierarchical attitude yes. I avoided in mm. Ayoka. No, that's absolutely fantastic actually. I mean learning from both you and Govind, mm. I mean I probably adopted very similar policies when I was Vice Chancellor at Cotton University where mm -hmm. even the junior most faculty, you know, even staff members could come and argue with me and I opened door for everybody. But, uh, but in most universities that is not the case and, and I think we need to sort of see how to bring about the cultures which you have set up in Ayuka into a larger mm. number of institutions. Yeah. I think w what one needs is a sense of humor. Sense of humor, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then you are much <laughs> better off. <laughs> okay. okay. Mm. Uh, again, I'll just touch on one or two other aspects. One aspect is that uh, I mentioned about the first time I uh, met you. The, se the second is that the first time I got a letter from you was when we 
as a young student, I we said Basan Kulkarni and I had written a paper on angular size evolution, and we sent it to you, and you sent us a very sort of encouraging reply back. It was a very ordinary paper, but your your words were very comforting, and and it encourages us as young students. And I think you reply to almost all or almost every letter that you get. Hmm. And that is also a fantastic culture which uh, you have been, you have. And what led you to it, and why do you think that is very important? You see, I, I feel that uh, if you engage in correspondence or talk hmm. talk to them, hmm. uh, they feel much more at home hmm. with you or your institution or establishment. Hmm. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, many times the case in India, uh, mm. uh, writing a reply yes. is considered as a demeaning yourself. When you are yeah. going down, you must make yourself uh, full of importance. Yes. That is what every bureaucrat type of thing, yes. you must have that, yes. which is not the right attitude Absolutely. to have. Yeah. Uh, you should, in fact, get interaction with the person. Yes. Make him feel comfortable. Yes. That is the point. No, I, I think that's really fantastic. And you mentioned about a sense of humor a little while earlier. And uh, perhaps we could end by, uh, you know, you, I remember that when I was pouring my woes out to you at Gohati when you and Mangala visited us uh, about a joke. Uh, uh, where a sage was uh, was not getting his food because of a dog, and so perhaps you could end with some interesting incident or some humorous incident from your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's difficult to remember suddenly, but that dog story was supposedly from some version of Ramayana, okay. <laughs> in which it uh, you the story was that in Ram Rajya. Uh, there was a dog who came to the king and said to Rama and said that I have a complaint. So against whom? So there is a uh, sadhu or sannyasi uh, who is outside. He uh, kicked me unnecessarily. So they called the sannyasi and asked him that this dog says, you kicked him without any provocation. And the dog itself looked very ugly and ferocious. So the sannyasi said that this dog kept following me. And wherever I went for uh, uh, bhiksha, the, the lady would give me something for lady of the house. The moment she opened the door and saw the dog, she would shut the door and not uh, give me anything. So I got very hungry and all because of this dog accompanying me. So I kicked him to let him go away. So I, he said that I'm sorry that the dog had no, uh, uh, did not cause any problem, but he looked so ferocious that people did not give me anything to eat. So I am hungry. So, um, you can give me any punishment you like. So, the uh, Rama asked the dog, what do you want to punish him with? So, he said that uh, you create a university and make him the vice chancellor of the university. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ram was say, say, surprised, he said, this is a risk position of respect, uh, you, are you going to give him a good position instead of uh, punishing him? So the dog said, no, no, once he becomes a vice chancellor, he will know how, how there are different problems to solve <laughs> and he's, he will be all the time worried with answers. <laughs> so uh, that is why I am suggest suggesting. So this was this story I was telling you, and so as Vice Chancellor, you can appreciate the humor behind it. Uh, I, I will just tell you one more episode sure. uh, involving another Vice Chancellor. Sure. 
so i won't tell from which university sure. but i was invited to give a talk in a, a sort of important lecture in a university which the vc was to preside on so it was a, meant to be at say 10, 11 o'clock in the morning so i went to i was told to come to vc's house and then we will go together so i came to vc's house quarter to 11 mm. and he was there and uh, at it was only 5 minutes ride from where we were vc's lodge to the mm. main auditorium mm. so at um, when it became came to close to 11 i said should we go now so he said no no sit down uh, would you like some tea i said no i don't want to <laughs> drink tea I, i have come now for lecture at 11 so i should uh, be worried about people waiting there so he said no don't worry let us see let us wait so when it was half past 11 he said now we can go why uh, late because unless you make you you make them wait for you they don't realize how important you are <laughs> that sad. was <laughs> the very sad. attitude yeah, very sad i think i will stop yeah, yeah. thank you very much ed thanks yeah. a lot